Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the UCL's uh, Lunch Hour Lecture. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Philip Sands, AC, who will deliver UCL's Lunch Hour Lecture today. Uh, Philip is Professor of Law and Director of the Center on International Courts and Tribunals at UCL. He is also a practicing lawyer at 11 Kings Bench Walk and is one of the most prominent international human rights lawyers in the world today. One of the delights of working at UCL is that you can connect with colleagues from different disciplines and have fascinating conversations that challenge and inform your own thinking. Sometimes you connect with these colleagues when you mutually Google each other in an esoteric online university meeting because the other person has just made enormous sense and then realize that you in fact share some interests. I researched development of antisocial behavior and psychopathy and Philip and I have had a number of exchanges about the nature and origins of violence and hate and the impact of trauma on people's lives. These are also some of the themes that Philip eloquently explores in his books. As many of you will know, he is an award-winning author of a number of international bestsellers, including East West Street, and has served as the president of English Pen. If I were to list all of his accolades, we would uh, take up most of the hour, and I think we are all keen to get to Philip's talk. In his lunch hour lecture today, Philip will share with us a story about the making of modern international law and the fight for justice, as told in his new book, The Last Colony. He has a unique ability to bring legal issues alive, even to non-experts, but I think his greatest gift is to never lose the sight of the human. We really look forward to hearing your lecture, Philip. Before I hand over to you, I wanted to remind people that we have some time at the end of the lecture for questions, and these can be submitted at any point during the talk by going to Slido and entering the event code, hashtag last colony. I'll now hand over to you, Philip. Thank you so much, Essie. It's incredibly lovely to be doing this with you, and you've captured in particular the sense of happiness of being part of a community in which we can, in my case, get out of the confines of the legal world. Um, and in my interactions with you, learn more about why people behave as they do, which in the world of law, I fear students uh, are often not talked about. And so I'm going to skew my words slightly to areas that may be of interest with you and ask really some sort of questions about why it is that certain things uh, have happened. So to, to give a little bit of context, I'm going to talk about um, the subject of my most recent book. It came out uh, in September, uh, so three or four months ago. It's called The Last Colony, and it tells a story uh, that I must declare uh, an interest in at the outset. I am not a, a wholly independent observer in relation to the story because I have been involved as a lawyer, as a barrister, working for the government of a small African country uh, called Mauritius, which has brought proceedings against the United Kingdom and before the International Court of Justice in relation to the events that I'm going to talk about. So please forgive me if at times I give the impression of being more partial than I should. I do try to distance myself wearing my academic hat. So Mauritius, as I mentioned, is the country uh, that is in Africa. It's located in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it was uh, previously a colony uh, of Portugal and of the Netherlands, and then a colony of France. In 1814, it became a colony of the United Kingdom, and it remained a colony of the United Kingdom until 1968. And in March 1968, the former British colony of Mauritius attained independence. It became a member of the United Nations, one of about 200 countries now, and started to make its way in the world, not as a colony, but as an independent country. The, one of the challenges for Mauritius was that it did not achieve independence uh, with its full territorial integrity. Three years before Mauritius became independent, a part of its territory was chopped off. Um, that part of the territory is known as the Chagos Archipelago. It's actually about a thousand miles from Mauritius. Uh, it 
uh, is located slap bang in the middle of the Indian Ocean. If you know your geography, the nearest other country is the Maldives. It's about 300 miles uh, south of the Maldives. That gives you a sense of where it is. But from 1814 onwards, it was always treated as an integral part of the territory of the colony of Mauritius. And my book, The Last Colony, describes the circumstances and the human consequences of what happens when a colonial power removes part of the territory of a country before it grants independence to that colony. Now, to just go back with a little bit of history, just to put this in context, the British Empire and colonialism around the world dominated for large parts of the world during the 18th and 19th centuries, and for also the early part of the 20th century. But in 1945, a major change took place. In the United Nations Charter, adopted in San Francisco uh, in uh, April 1945, it was agreed that the colonial powers, mostly European, uh, would decolonize. They would give independence to their colonies around the world, in Africa, in Asia, in South America, and uh, in other parts of the world. And that process began immediately. You're all aware of what happened, for example, with India, which attained its independence uh, in 1947 with a great deal of bloodshed. And the process of decolonization began immediately after the United Nations Charter was adopted and was agreed by many countries. As the process evolved, new tweaks were introduced to determine the circumstances and conditions under which countries would attain their independence. And in 1960, the United Nations adopted an important uh, decision. It's a resolution of the General Assembly, which uh, determined that there was what the resolution called a right to self-determination. Now, again, this is one aspect that is of, I think, particular importance, the work of uh, of Essie. Um, the idea of self-determination in international law is that a community should have a degree of autonomy in the sense that it should be able to decide for itself the conditions under which it is governed and not have matters of governance imposed upon it from outside. It's analogous, I think, to individual autonomy and the idea um, of individual rights and the idea that we should each be able to determine for ourselves how we are going to spend our days and what we're going to do. The same thing exactly happens in international law. The resolution was called Resolution 1514, and it had one other very important rule in it, and that was this. It committed countries around the world to respect the idea of territorial integrity. What this meant was that when a country was given independence by the colonial power, the colonial power was completely precluded from chopping off or keeping a bit of the territory unless the population affected by such an act had given its consent. This is an absolutely crucial point. So you get a sense in a nutshell of the architecture of the international rules by the mid 1960s. This is the background against which in the early 1960s, the United States develops a policy of placing military bases at strategic locations around the world. And in particular, what is particularly attractive to the United States military is distant islands on which there are limited or no populations on which in uh, strategically important places they can establish a military base. One such island, if you've not heard of Jake, the Chagos Archipelago, you may have heard of one of the islands uh, which forms part of the Chagos Archipelago, and that is uh, Diego Garcia, today one of the largest military bases in the world. In 1963, the United States determined we like the look of Diego Garcia, we would be grateful if the British could give it to us for a long period so that we can develop a military base on the island. And the British agreed. It was a delicate moment for the United Kingdom. They had declined to participate in the uh, Vietnam War. And they felt, I think, slightly beholden to the Americans with the incipient so-called 
a special relationship, a, a special relationship incidentally, which my wife, who's American, says is only a one-way special relationship, um, United Kingdom to United States and not vice versa. The British acceded and they said yes to the Americans, you can have Diego Garcia. And the Americans said, well, actually be very useful if we can have it without its population. There were three or 400 individuals living there. Uh, and the British said, fine, we will sort that out. Now, again, let me just give you a little more context about the Chagos Archipelago. Uh, it's about 58 tiny islands and atolls scattered across 640,000 square kilometers of the Indian Ocean. And it has sustained a population for centuries. Um, as a colony, the British uh, developed uh, economic activity, plantations, turning uh, coconuts into oil. And to do that, they needed labor. And to do that in particular, they needed labor by enslaved people. And so enslaved people were brought in by the French and the British from Madagascar and from Mozambique uh, from the late 18th century. And the families remained. and had children and second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generations um, arrived. So by the mid 1960s, there were about 2000 Chagossians or Ilwa island people, um, all, almost all black and almost all descended from enslaved people. The British decided they would accede to the American request and get rid of these people on Diego Garcia, but they faced a greater problem. This new rule that I'd mentioned earlier had come into being uh, to the effect that uh, you can only cut off a part of a territory of a colony if you have um, the consent of the population affected. The British got themselves into a bit of a pickle uh, with the benefit of their lawyers and concluded that they would have to remove the entire population of the entire Chagos archipelago in order to uh, proceed with their project. And this they determined to do. They did not consult the Chagossians. Why? Because they determined that the Chagossians were not a population. They were not residents of the Chagos archipelago. They had no rights. They had no autonomy. They were all of them contract laborers who were there as workers. Even if they were three year old, they were there as laborers. And so the United Kingdom bypassed the need to uh, ask the Chagossians what they wanted. The British did ask the incipient leadership of Mauritius what they wanted. And they said, no, we want the whole of our country when we get independence, we don't want you to cut it off. At which point in 1965, they were summoned to London and basically given an ultimatum. Either you accept the dismemberment of your territory and the retention by the United Kingdom of the Chagos Archipelago, or you do not get your independence. And under that pressure, some would say duress, they acceded to the separation of the Chagos Archipelago, which was immediately created into a new colony, Britain's last colony ever created, and today Britain's last colony in Africa called the British Indian Ocean Territory. That happened in 65. The Americans were given their military base a couple of years later on one of the islands, Diego Garcia. And then between 1968 and 1973, the entire population was removed. Removed is a bit of an understatement. Removed is forcibly removed, deported. And deportation of a population, of an entire population this way, is a big no-no in international law. In 1945, at Nuremberg, this kind of action was characterized as a crime against humanity, something I've written about in the um, book East West Street. So that's the context. Mauritius gets independence. For the first 15 years or so of independence, it, um, it really does nothing much about Chagos. It's so dependent on the United Kingdom for exports of um, its one product, which is sugarcane. Um, and then in 1982, Mauritius changes position. A new government comes in, and it calls for the completion of its decolonization. It wants Chagos back. And at the United Nations, for the first time, it calls for it. There are diplomatic and political initiatives for about three decades, which lead to nothing much at all. Although the pressure begins to increase on the United Kingdom, the African Union, uh, the non-aligned movement all become quite supportive. And by 2010, 
Britain is facing increasing pressure in relation to its stance. And its stance is further compounded in terms of difficulties by the fact that there have been some notorious acts taking place on Diego Garcia in the recent past, which are causing the British considerable embarrassment. One such act is that it emerges that Diego Garcia was the military base from which the bombing of Baghdad began in 2003 in a war that many people, myself included, considered to have been manifestly illegal under international law. But even more sensitive was the emergence of information in 2006 and 2007 that in their practice of what is known as extraordinary rendition, basically transporting um, uh, detainees from one place in the world to another for the purposes of torture at Guantanamo or at Bagram, the Americans had in fact used Diego Garcia as a stop-off point, and this raised issues about British complicity. Against this background, in 2010, the British Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, decided he wanted to sort of clean up Britain's image in relation to Diego Garcia and Chagos, and announced the creation of a vast marine protected area. Uh, 640,000 square kilometers of pristine environment that would be protected forever and all human activity banned except on the US military base. And this was welcomed by the environmentalists and environmental NGOs and others until it emerged around the same time through WikiLeaks and a vast array of diplomatic cables from the United States that made its way into public domain, that one of the true purposes of the creation of the marine protected area was to stop the Chagossians from ever returning. The uh, diplomatic cable that was most notorious had a British Foreign Office official telling the Americans that one of the great advantages of the marine protected area, and please accept my apologies for the language that I'm about to use, but it is in cable itself, was that the um, marine protected area would mean that the Man Fridays would no longer be able to return. In other words, it became apparent that the environment was being uh, harnessed to extinguish the rights of human beings who had been deported uh, many decades earlier, and their descendants, second, third, and even fourth generation. This caused outrage. Mauritius decided as a government that it would bring legal proceedings to try to challenge this issue, and retained a legal team. I was very privileged to um, be retained by the government of Mauritius to lead the legal team. And we began by designing a legal strategy to recover the Chagos Archipelago. I won't now go into all of the details that's set out in the book, um, which was written, as I say, to allow this story to reach a broader audience. But eventually, in 2016, 2017, the matter made its way to the United Nations General Assembly, which was presented with an opportunity uh, to vote, to send a resolution to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations to determine uh, whether or not the colonization, decolonization of Mauritius had been completed in accordance with international law. By 2017, when the vote came up, the circumstances of the United Kingdom had changed very dramatically. Many of you will recall that in June 2016, Britain voted to leave the European Union, Brexit. This has had dramatic consequences, not only domestically, as some of you are now feeling in terms of energy prices and jobs and so on and so forth, but also in relation to Britain's place in the world. And its international support more or less collapsed. It became pretty much a lone player. And the resolution at the UN General Assembly was passed by an overwhelming majority, uh, 94 votes in favour, just 16 votes against, and the rest were abstentions. And so off we went to the International Court of Justice. Now, at this point, we move into the area that I think is uh, as Professor Vidding's uh, expertise. How do you actually make the arguments before an international court? I, for many of you, you will imagine that this is about setting out the facts, which it is, 
what actually happened and setting out the law and making your legal arguments, which of course it is also. But I've long been of the view that a panel of judges sitting on an international case, as with a domestic case, are not just judges. In this case, there were 14 judges sitting on the case, but human beings. And they are individual human beings. And they have their individual propensities and ideologies and cultures and beliefs and legal training and so on and so forth. So that in designing a legal strategy in a hearing, you have to be attentive to the fact that this isn't just a sort of a single mass, a group of 14 judges acting as one. They are individuals with their own propensities and predispositions. And you had to have regard to that. They come from 14 different countries. You've got to have regard to that too. There's an American, there's a Chinese, there's a Russian, there's a Ugandan, there's an Italian. I mean, they're, they're from all over the world. And the president of the court, very fortunate, I think, for Mauritius, is a leading African scholar and international lawyer, Abdullahi Yusuf, who happens to be from Somalia, who, of course, knows a thing or two about colonialism because he has uh, written about growing up in Somalia under British and Italian rule. Uh, he and I have subsequently um, laughed at the image of him as a little boy singing Italian songs and dancing around an Italian flag. The point that I'm making is that when you make legal arguments before an international court, you're acutely aware of the backgrounds of these individuals, and you are fine-tuning the arguments you will make to make sure that they resonate with these individuals and that you avoid raising issues that may cause difficulties with these individuals. But there was another aspect in which the individual human became, I think, even more important. And, and this is also reflected in, in the book, The Last Colony. The opening words and the closing words of the book are really not mine. They are those of a Chagossian, a remarkable Chagossian lady who's now um, in her 70th year. Her name is Lisby Elise. She was born in 1953 on a small island called Perros Banos. Uh, she grew up there very happily. She married in 1973, and indeed she became pregnant. And then on April the 28th, a group of administrators arrived on her island. Uh, they were British. And as she described to me, this was the first time she had ever encountered people who were white. And they told her, uh, and everyone else who lived on her island, about 400 individuals, that they would all be leaving tomorrow and they would be allowed to take with them a single suitcase. This, of course, came as a terrible shock um, to her, Lisby Elise, and to all of the individuals who'd been living there, blissfully unaware that this was about to happen. N now, again, in this story, there is another individual um, who is a player, and that is the author of the book, which is me. When I met Liz Bielise for the first time, and she told me this story, and she mentioned, um, I believe I was told I was leaving tomorrow and I could take one suitcase, that resonated with me. Because for those of you who've read East West Street, you will know that one of the stories that I tell is of my two great grandmothers who were living in Vienna in the summer of 1942, and they received exactly the same instruction. You are leaving tomorrow and you are entitled to take a single suitcase. So I found myself in this very curious position of being with a lady, uh, Lisby Elise, who's rather different from my own background, black lady, an African lady who had never really been to school, could not read and could not write, but who was articulating in my presence something that touched me from my own family situation very deeply. And that caused a real bond to be created between us. Now, why am I focusing on Lisby Elise? I'm focusing on Lisby Elise because we came to understand the lawyers and the government of Mauritius that in arguing the case before the International Court of Justice, we considered that it was hugely important that Chagossian voices be heard before the court. Uh, we did that in two stages. 
The first stage was we got a number of witness statements, Trugostians to prepare witness statements to describe what had happened to them at the time of their deportation, to describe what had happened to them subsequently, and to express their desires for the future, and in particular to articulate whether they wish to go back, why they wish to go back to the land where they were born. They all explained in their oral testimony, which was recorded and then reduced into writing, that they wanted to die and end their days on the land where they were born, which I think is a very natural feeling for many people. So those witness statements went into the written phase of the pleading, but there is then an oral phase of the pleading. And that oral phase um, this last just a week. Each country is given a certain amount of time. Mauritius was given two and a half hours to present its case. So was the United Kingdom. And we decided as a team that the judges must hear directly from H. Garcia because it would help them understand that what we were dealing with here were not arcane, factual, and legal arguments. We were dealing about a case which had enormous consequences for real, living, sentient, dignified, intelligent human beings who really cared about the outcome. With the limited time available, we concluded that we would only have time for a single Chagossian to appear as a witness and tell their story. We went through a process to decide who it would be. We settled without much difficulty, I have to say, on a female voice, um, largely because in terms of going through the process, we felt that the female voices that we heard had both a greater resonance and a greater authority, and they spoke with absolute clarity. And in the end, we settled on Lisby Elysee, whose history I've summoned to you. Now, Lisby was, she's an enormously strong and courageous person. She's been involved in this struggle for many years. She's a truly remarkable individual. But as I mentioned, she can't read and she can't write. And this posed a particular challenge because the classical approach before the International Court of Justice is that you go to the bar, you stand up and you read from a prepared text. And part of the reason that you have to do that is that time is very limited and you can't have people standing up and going on for much longer than they are supposed to go on to because that then interrupts the timetable. So we faced a problem. We decided to get around this with Lisby's permission to, um, but by asking the court whether on this occasion, it had never happened before, she could prepare her testimony in a recorded video statement. And the court, we were very delighted, uh, agreed to this. Actually, Lisby was rather pleased also because I think it was less anxiety inducing for her to pre record it. And so in Mauritius, in Pohlu, in the capital, she recorded her statement. It lasted just three minutes and 47 seconds. She described what had happened to her. She described briefly her life after she arrived in Mauritius, having spent five days on a boat, what it meant to lose her child. She had been pregnant and she believed that the trauma had caused her to miscarry. Um, and she described being treated, in her words, as an animal and as a slave. And she ended her video by expressing her fervent hope that she would be able to end her days on her terre natale, on the land of her birth. And then when she stopped speaking, uh, and you can uh, Watch the video for yourself, it's available on, on, on the internet. She covered her face, there was a movement of her hand like this, and she began to weep. And we faced here as lawyers a, 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 a challenge and an issue. Did we include that in the video we placed before the court, or did we cut the video at the moment at which she began to weep. Now, just to explain the thinking here, uh, and all these kinds of issues are debated very strongly in a legal team, the concern was not that we had any objection to Lisby Elise weeping, but judges tend not to like it when they are presented 
with an overtly emotional response in the courtroom. This generally doesn't go down well with judges. Judges like a degree of restraint and self-control and so on and so forth. And some of the members of the team said, look, the judge, you know, whatever advantage we get from putting the witness statement in and the testimony in might be lost or partly undermined by some of the judges feeling that we're using emotional arguments uh, to win a legal case. And I understand that argument, but in the end, I didn't agree with it and I didn't support it. The more powerful argument, it seemed to me, was in favour of respecting Lisby's dignity and Lisby's autonomy, and that to cut her video in any way would in effect return to the situation of 1973 when she was forcibly removed, when she was deported, and not to fully respect her own will. And we asked her about it and she said no, she wanted it kept in. And so we decided to keep it in. I was the one who presented it to the court. Um, and I must confess, I was a little anxious. Um, a, a weeping African lady may not be what all of the judges wish to be presented with, but I was wrong. Um, this moment of the playing of the video, the silence that followed, is I think engraved in my recollection as the single most significant moment I've ever experienced uh, in a case before the International Court. The effect was dramatic and transformative. There was silence and then something I had never heard in the court before, there were tears. Uh, and the case then proceeded. The legal arguments finished. We all went away. And six months later, the court gave its decision. And it upheld completely the claims of Mauritius. It concluded that the decolonization of Mauritius had not been uh, completed lawfully in accordance with international law, largely because at the moment the Mauritian leadership in 1965 had been given an ultimatum, the court concluded they had been pressurized, they'd been subjected to duress. They had not freely given their will and consent to the dismemberment of their territory. That is the beating heart of this story. It's about autonomy, it's about will, it's about consent, and it's about respect. And that view had not been respected. And that is a decision of the court from which no judge dissented. None of the 14 judges dissented. So it becomes a moment of singular importance, an articulation of respect for the population that was consulted but subject to duress, and respect for the population that was never consulted at all, the Chagossians. So the court concluded that decolonization was not complete. The separation of Chagos was indeed uh, manifestly illegal and without effect, and it followed that Chagos belonged not to the United Kingdom, but to Mauritius. And the second question, what are the legal consequences of this? The court argued, uh, concluded very uh, crisply, the United Kingdom must leave the Chagos archipelago immediately. That was February 2019. The matter then went back to the General Assembly of the United Nations, which voted by an even more overwhelming margin, 116 votes in favour to six against, to um, give effect to the decision of the International Court of Justice, and it determined that the Chagossians were all entitled to return, and that um, the United Kingdom must leave by November 2019. The United Kingdom decided not to leave. The United Kingdom decided it would tough it out for reasons of national security and disrespect the ruling of the International Court of Justice. And that, of course, was a major disappointment to me, to the Chagossians, to the government of Mauritius. But we then began to take steps to address that United Kingdom failure by bringing various other steps and proceedings, political, diplomatic and legal. And in particular, we got a judgment binding in international law from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea to the effect that the International Court of Justice's ruling and advisory opinion was determinative and authoritative and had binding legal effects. And right now, the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is delimiting the maritime boundary between Mauritius, Chagos and uh, the Maldives. 
Now, as all of this was going on, I, wearing another hat as an academic, decided that I wanted to write a book. And the main reason for writing the book was that I've come to the realization with my other writings that our legal scholarship, our legal arguments in cases is, of course, enormously significant, but it does only tend to reach a very small audience in relation to academic writings, which is our academic colleagues, in relation to our legal initiatives, um, it um, reaches uh, a broader audience, but not a huge audience. But I'd learned with East West Street and Ratline that it turns out that the grand public actually has a tremendous capacity to um, cope with legal issues, legal arguments, matters of international law, if it's presented in a way that is accessible and in particular uh, related to the human. One of my great heroes in international law is the scholar Judge Hirsch Lauterpacht, inventor of the concept of crimes against humanity, whose ethos was that essentially at the end of the day, the individual is the fundamental unit of international law. And that, that is an idea that I am particularly attached to. And I wanted to find ways to get this story in the most human way possible to as broad an audience as possible. And so the last colony became my COVID project. Um, I wrote it almost as an act of advocacy, one can say, with, with the aim of essentially trying to shift things to get the British to change position and allow Lisby and all of her colleagues to go back. The book came out in uh, September of last year, so four or five months ago. Um, it has drawings because that too helps to reach a broader audience by the Guardian cartoonist Martin Rousson. Um, and like other books, it develops a life of its own. It gets um, reviews and gets picked up and sells and reaches a broader audience. Um, interestingly, one of the things that I've learned in the United Kingdom is that if you write a book about Nazis, you will be picked up by every newspaper in the country. Uh, if you write about a, a book about the excesses of British colonial rule, some of the newspapers will shy away uh, from dealing with that subject. Maybe we can come back to that uh, a little bit more. But, and I can't, of course, say cause and effect, um, the consequence, who knows what it was, but uh, may have been entirely coincidental, three months later, in November, 2022, so just a few weeks ago, the British government announced a change of position, that it would immediately begin negotiations with Mauritius in relation to the exercise of sovereignty over the Chagos of Archipelago on the basis of international law, and those negotiations are now underway. I think we can now expect um, the possibility, the very real possibility, of Lisbeth Elysee and co, and her colleagues, her comrades, going back to her home at some point in the near future. That really is a realistic prospect. In fact, as those of you who've read the book will know, in February of last year, 25 people sailed to the Chagos Archipelago on a Mauritian chartered ship, Mauritian government officials, lawyers, um, but also five Chagossians, including Lisbeth Elise. And we spent five days on the Chagos Archipelago. It was astonishing. Of all the aspects of it that touched me, beyond the moment when Lisby Elysee got off the boat, stepped on land, bent over, picked up a handful of sand and allowed it to pass through her hands. Beyond that extraordinary moment, which I felt very privileged to witness after a forcible deportation that took place 50 years ago, um, we then went to start the cleanup. It was extraordinary. Um, of the church, uh, where they had all been baptized, but also of the cemetery, which is the most extraordinary place, uh, completely overgrown after 50 years, if you like, of non-care and attention. But all the gravestones there, uh, going back more than 200 years, a reflection of the existence of a settled community one with a long existence, one with respect for forebears. Um, and that was hugely significant. So 
to end and perhaps to throw some ideas out for Professor Bidding, for my dear friend Essie, one of the things, of course, that has been a big aspect for me in this process is why has it taken so long for the United Kingdom to come to terms with the wrong that it has so evidently uh, done? The Mauritians had long ago said the base can stay, but under our sovereignty. And what was it about a sense of hubris that caused the British to dig their heels in, to deport people, to never really come to terms in a sense of accountability for what they've done. And then when an international court and then a second international court rules that it's illegal, instead of saying we've done wrong and cleaning up the wrong, they dig their heels in until it becomes impossible, the pressures become impossible, such that they really have to uh, comply with the decisions. And to end, I just want to suggest one aspect of what is really going on here. I went back in writing this book to my school books from childhood. I wanted to know why it was that when I was first called by the Prime Minister of Mauritius, I didn't know where Chagos was and I'd never heard this story. How could that be? I almost felt a sense of shame that I, you know, deeply immersed in these issues and had just never heard this story. And I went back to my school history book, Jeffrey Treese, This Is Your Century, published in 1967. We used it in 1973-74. And it was a real shock, frankly, to read chapter eight, Sunset on Empire, describing Britain's colonial history, starting with India, comparing the remarkable British governor, Viscount Mountbatten, on the one hand, with the new incumbent of the office at the time of writing of the book, a small, disheveled, thin, vegetarian Indian who wore a loincloth, who was a pacifist, and who was described in my school history book, and I kid you not, and I apologize again for what I'm about to say, who was described, this is Mahatma Gandhi, as looking rather like a monkey with glasses. So that is what I was given as a schoolboy. We never talked about British Empire. We never talked about enslavement. We never talked about excesses. And I think I have imbued that in my life going forward. And it's really only with this story that I've come back in which the scales have fallen from my eyes and I've come to begin to understand. Faced directly with Lisby Elise telling me her story, what it meant to be a British colonial subject as recently as the 1970s. And it is, I think, the failure of this country to have come to terms with what it has done, to honestly account for what it's done, that is giving rise to so many difficulties now in modern Britain about its sense of self-identity, its worth and its place in the world. So let, let me end there, Essie, and let's now uh, go back to you and, and open it up for perhaps a little conversation and some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for absolutely um, fascinating um, and incredibly clear talk. Um, before um, I'm going to start by asking um, my own question, which is uh, which is the chair's privilege. But I want to remind that question can, questions can be submitted at any point um, by going to the Slido and entering the event code hashtag last colony. So please do submit your questions and I'll be able to uh, read those um, and ask them uh, to Philip. So, Philip, I wanted to sort of say that it strikes me as quite extraordinary that countries that tend to consider themselves as beacons of civilization, like UK and the United States, are able to trample over the human rights of others in quite such a spectacular way. You know, you give people one day to back their suitcase uh, and you think that that's absolutely OK thing to do. Uh, particularly as I suspect uh, the UK or US governments wouldn't consider doing this to their own citizens on their own soil. So to me, this sort of raises two quite troubling questions. Uh, first of 
which is whether the chakra cells were actually not really viewed as equivalently human. And the second is uh, whether a government that can do this might actually do it in its own soil if it could get away with it. Hmm. Well, I mean, as regards the first question, um, I think it's plain that the Chagossians were treated as other. I mean, the terms that we find in the contemporaneous documents from the 1960s and 70s, referring to them as Tarzans and Man Fridays, I think is pretty clear. And the Chagossians themselves, who are extremely articulate, very largely organized by one of the individuals who's litigated for them for 20 years. I didn't, I do in the book, but I, I didn't here have time to get into all of the efforts the Chagossian community themselves have made to litigate these issues in the English courts, led by a remarkable individual called Olivier Bancou, who was born on Paris Banyos and de essentially deported as a four-year-old contract laborer. Um, Olivier's black and Olivier says, Philippe, it's really clear to me that if we had been white, none of this would have happened. And he um, directs me to think about the treatment of the Falkland Islanders, also about two and a half thousand people. What is the difference? He asks entirely reasonably between the Falkland Islanders and the Chagossians. Well, you know, the main difference is the color of skin. And Olivier says very clearly, if, if they were white, he thinks this would never have happened, or if it had happened, um, it, it would have been ended very much earlier than than now, 60 years later. So I think, you know, we are aware, I'm aware in my work, you're very aware in your work, that sort of othering and treating another human being as somehow being different because of their um, ethnicity, their race, their religion, their nationality, whatever it may be, um, is part and parcel of many worlds and part and parcel of um, the British world. I mean, we've got it right now in the United Kingdom in another respect, um, the welcome or not that is being given to people who are refugees. Compare the treatment of Ukrainian uh, refugees. I'm very supportive of Ukraine, I think, as you know, um, but compare the treatment of Ukrainian refugees who want to come to the United Kingdom um, with uh, the treatment of Syrian refugees or Afghan refugees or Iraqi refugees. And you understand straight away that there is a difference. And you ask yourself the question, what is the difference? And it is very difficult to escape the conclusion. It's impossible to escape the conclusion as to what's really going on here. You know, get a bunch of people who are, you know, white, blonde, blue-eyed Christians, and the doors will be thrust open. Um, but if you don't quite meet those characteristics, it's off to Rwanda. So uh, I'm, I think the answer to your question is, is, is uh, with great regret, very, very clear. Now, your second question is a really interesting one. Um, could a community do it to its own? I mean, generally that doesn't happen. If you look in my work at acts of genocide or other mass crimes, crimes against humanity, there will always be a focus on the other, uh, whether it is a religious other or a tribal other or a national other or an ethnic other, that is the common theme that runs through all acts of mass horror, that it always begins with the identification of a community as the other. And that, of course, was the fundamental aspect of the work of Raphael Lemkin in inventing the concept of genocide uh, in 1944, 1945. Unlike Lauter Pact, who focused on the protection of the individual and said that all individuals have minimum rights under international law and must be protected equally as individuals, Lemkin said, no, I don't disagree with that. But the reality is, that if you go back in history, you will see that the mistreatment of an individual human being is not the consequence of something that individual human being has done but is inevitably a consequence of what that human being is. Lemkin talked about it in terms of ethnicity, race, religion, nationality. He didn't, for example, include things like sexual orientation or even gender, actually, um, which, of course, in the modern era, we would now address. 
But yeah, I think what I was sort of trying to lead into that yet yeah, there is othering, but the othering can also happen within your own country. And I think there have been some quite disturbing developments in the United States, for instance, recently with huge polarizations and and suddenly you see these, you know, people being treated perhaps in a way that you wouldn't the person who you consider to be in your own group. I, 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 absolutely. And I, I I and colleagues have long thought when you get these examples of um, a, a, a person with a gun going into a bar in a southern United States and sort of randomly killing 50 people because they're LGBTQI plus or something. Is that a genocidal act? Well, I mean, in theory, yes, it is. Targeting people not because of what they have done, but because of one or more characteristics of their identity is what Lemkin was all about. And that's what's happened in relation to Chagos. I mean, standing in the courtroom in September 2018, when we argued the case, it was, if you like, the great presence in the room that no one wanted really to articulate openly, race. These people were black. That yeah. was uh, everyone understood that. And the fact that we had a black president of the court, an African, a remarkable scholar, remarkable jurist, I think played a very important role. Yeah. Thank you. That's extremely interesting. I'm going to now go to questions um, from other people as well. Um, are Chagosians now returning? Do you think how, how likely you, it is that they will be able to return and how how many of them is are likely to return? Thank you for that question. I mean, I, I haven't had time today to go into detail on the nature of the Chagossian community. It's an immensely rich, but also very complex uh, community. The original couple of thousand from 1968 to 73 have, of course, grown. There are second generation, third generation, fourth generation, and they have been spread into different locations. So the great majority have been in Mauritius. There are some in Seychelles. There's a very small number in Réunion, which is part of France, very close to Mauritius. And then there's a very large community, mostly second, third, fourth generation, in the United Kingdom, around a town called Crawley near Gatwick Airport, which is they have, where they happen to land. As you get to know the Chagossian community, and, and I have respect equally for all members of the community, you will come up with a very big divergence of views. And many of the second, third and fourth generations in the United Kingdom are rather hostile to Mauritius. And actually, interestingly, would prefer that Chagos had stayed part of the United Kingdom. I mean, that ship has sailed, that has gone. And I've often wondered what that is about. I think it may be partly about the experiences that they've heard that when the Chagossians arrived in Mauritius, which is very largely dominated by Hindus of uh, Indian origin, the lot of a black person is, shall we say, perhaps not much better than it is in the United Kingdom. Indeed, it may be worse. And so the same issues that pertain in the United Kingdom pertain in Mauritius and in other places. And I think this is a real issue. But the second real issue has been that quite a few Chagossians have been windrushed. It's almost unbelievable. Having been deported from Chagos between 68 and 73, some of them have ended up in the United Kingdom, and they've then been deported a second time because their papers were not in order. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And so I think there is an understandable and perhaps justifiable fear on the part of the Chagossian community in the United Kingdom, that if they were to speak out against the British today, they would face consequences. But the upshot is there is not a single Chagossian voice, there is not a single Chagossian view. It's an enormously rich, diverse and complicated community. And the pool goes in many different directions. And I have to say, my instinct is that in part, in past, the United Kingdom has used those differences of views. I mean, the United Kingdom is a, a master of divide and rule in, in causing mayhem amongst communities. Great, thank you. Um, but but to, to answer the question, yes, I think those who want to go back, and Mauritius has said anyone who wants to go back can go back. I think with a bit of luck, the negotiations could move forward in the course of this year, and we're talking about a return 
um, very soon thereafter. And, and will there be any compensation that will enable these people to start their lives? You know, they were plucked, you, you know, from their homes, uh, sent somewhere where they weren't given good livelihoods. And now, obviously, where they used to live, you know, the, the buildings have decayed or don't exist anymore. Well, they've had very small amounts of compensation. I mean, really pitifully small amounts. Um, and, and that's helped to a limited extent. But let's go straight to the chase. To deport an entire population, in my view, is a crime against humanity. Okay. Um, and watch this space. I think that in the next two or three weeks, Human Rights Watch are going to prepare and publish a report on the treatment of the Chagossians. And I think it will say something about crimes against humanity. And it will say something about the right to reparation for a crime against humanity. And I think the right to reparation is inherent where such an international crime uh, has been perpetrated. And um, uh, let us see what the United Kingdom and to the extent they have been complicit, which I think they have been, the Americans, um, are willing to make good um, uh, the perpetration of past horrors. But reparation is undoubtedly in the Chagossian community's minds, and I think rightly, in my view, part of the overall equation. You can't you can't move on until you've really addressed the wrong that has been done. And some of it is not going to be addressed merely by allowing people to go back. Absolutely. And and even, even by paying financial reparations, you're obviously not going to do away with what happened. Um, final question. I think we have to keep this uh, brief. Um, there are clearly deep sort of inequalities in financial positions of, of people, some of which will allow things like this uh, to happen. And this presumably also played a role in, in terms of how long it took for Shakosians to bring the British government to justice. You know, it's only really when the Morrison government got involved and there were other countries that supported the action uh, among the United Nations that this, this case moved forward. And it sort of seems to highlight that, you know, there is to a certain degree, depending on how wealthy you are, you will have different kind of justice. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's right. I think ultimately it needed the catalyzing effect of the Mauritian government to get involved, to bring this to a head. But I do want to stress that it was the Chagossians themselves who gave Mauritius the material and gave the African Union the material to make the change happen. Um, in two ways. Firstly, I mentioned already the litigation by Olivier Bancou in the English courts. This threw up, by process of discovery, a whole raft of documents and material, including the crucial contemporaneous evidence from 1965, which the court relied upon to conclude that the, Chagos, that the Mauritians had been subject to duress. Without all the material that Olivier Bancou and his team had obtained, I think we would have been in real difficulty on proving that. And the second thing, and I really do believe this, I think Liz Bielizé's witness testimony was transformative. It was the transformative moment in the proceedings. And in this way, she was the architect of the conclusion that the court reached, I think in very large part. But it is clear, as I say in the book, Right in the opening pages, Liz Bielize asked me after we'd had our day in court, why did it take so long to get to The Hague? I think it took so long to get to The Hague because this was an impoverished black community. And I think it had been a wealthy white community. There's no doubt it would not have lingered for 50, 60 years. It would have been addressed much earlier. The community would have had the ways, the means, and the support in the establishment to change this much more quickly. So I think it's- a Or it may not have happened in the first place. Or it may not have happened, or it may, yeah. Yeah, very, well, I think probably that's even more likely. If these have been, you know, jolly white folk living on a faraway island, you can imagine the fuss in the Daily Mail and the Telegraph if somehow Britain now says we're deporting the entire population of the Falkland Islands, Malvinas, so and sending them to various other parts of the world. You can see what the reaction would be. So. I think the answer to the question is, is yes. The nature of the community, of course, determines uh, what's going to happen 
in the quest for justice. I mean, let's finish, though, on a positive note. International law has been slow. I'm not starry eyed about that. But it is in the process of delivering. And when we set foot on Peras, Banyas and Salomon Island on the Chagos Archipelago in February of last year, just a few months ago, we did so because of the rulings of a bunch of international judges. And that is a good thing. And that ought to be celebrated. Too slow, wow. too long, but nevertheless, potentially a very decent outcome. Excellent. This is a wonderful note on which to um, close this event. I want to close by thanking you, Philip, for this Thank incredibly you, fascinating and sort of life affirming talk and yeah. also for the audience for participating in this event. And I want to alert everyone to the next UCL Lantau lecture, which takes place on Tuesday, 24th of uh, January. The lecture is delivered by William Blacker, and the lecture title is Together and Apart, Remembering Jewish Ukraine in the Context of Empire and War, and it marks the 2023 Holocaust Memorial Track Day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you all soon. In person next, I hope.